Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, taking you through the Bible in one year. It is very, very exciting. As a matter of fact, going from Revelation or going from Genesis to Revelation is exciting and energetic because this Bible is relevant today. Now, one person who helps us do this is Corey. And Corey, what are you studying today? Today we're going to be taking a look at two very important cities that show up in multiple places in the Old Testament. Excellent. Very good. And you studied today. Did, what did you come up with? Today we're going to take a look at Proverbs chapter 18 verses 10 and 11. Excellent job. Now we are going to study, Ryan, what happened? Where are you talking from, Ryan? Well, today we study a fascinating mystery that apparently even the author of Proverbs did not understand. <laughs> the author of Proverbs didn't understand it. I look forward to that, Ryan. That'll be good. Also, in our teaching segment, we're going to be talking about this. When we are lonely and cut off from others, we are distorted in our minds, distorted in our reality. And how in the world are we to handle that? That's something that we're going to be talking about in the teaching segment. So get ready to go because we are going to study. Get your Bible out and your Bible out and let's go. The first key city of the Old Testament that you and I are going to be taking a look at today is the ancient city of Megiddo. And then we're going to speak a little bit about uh, the concept of city gates and fortified cities and how they relate to Proverbs. The ancient city of Megiddo strategically sits in the Jezreel Valley that runs right across the land of Israel, connecting the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the Jordan River in the east, a giant natural highway. It also intersects with several north-south trade routes, so whoever controls Megiddo can exert widespread power over the trade and warfare of the land. Famously, Pharaoh of Egypt, Tutmos III, said that capturing Megiddo was as good as capturing 1,000 cities. From all the levels of destruction at the city, it's clear that many other leaders felt the same way. In fact, the reason Megiddo is such a large hill today is due to the city being destroyed and rebuilt so many times. The newer levels were built right on top of the destroyed layers. From what archaeologists can reconstruct, Megiddo was under Egyptian control until some point during the biblical time period of the Judges. By the time King Solomon came to the throne, Megiddo was one of his building projects. He fortified the city's walls and installed one of his famous six-chambered gates. After the Kingdom of Israel split under Solomon's son Rehoboam, the fate of Megiddo was to be conquered and reconquered by nations vying for control. But there is one incident that stands out, the death of King Josiah. The once dominant nation of Assyria was struggling to hold off the growing power of Babylon. Egypt was marching up through Judah to help Assyria. But Josiah decided to stand in the way. At Megiddo, Josiah was killed in battle. He was the last king in the line of David who rose to the throne without foreign invention, and he lost his life here. Biblical prophecy says that one day the Messiah will win another battle here and usher back the days of David's throne. In our listed reading of Proverbs today, there was a few mentions of fortified cities and fortified gates within those verses. Now, uh, a, a fortified city was necessary in ancient Israel, in the ancient Middle East, to protect a city from invasion, from war, uh, and it, it offered uh, people who lived within the city uh, an ability to uh, have different professions. So the, the concept of a city was people would gather together, they would be protected by the wall, uh, they would have deal 
deals with farmers that lived outside the wall, and everyone could have their own profession. Now, uh, interesting to trace the origin of the city back in Genesis. If you do a study on the origin of the city, I encourage you to do that. Uh, it, it may not be what you expect. It wasn't something that was ordained by God. It came about uh, by human, uh, human nature and humanity needing to survive. Uh, anyway, I digress. Uh, a fortified city was an interesting thing in the ancient world, and, and maybe to our modern eyes today, it would seem impossible to overcome giant walls that are four, five, six feet thick. Uh, but it could be done. Uh, warfare became an art very early on, unfortunately, in human history. And one of the ways that was very successful of uh, getting walls down uh, was actually creating a fire around a certain section of the wall and superheating it until the rocks would begin to crack. And we will see this in a few weeks here on Quick Study when we get into the book of Jeremiah. Today, people isolate themselves from real involvement with others. They discovered the internet. Television has reached its full potential, isolating people from each other. Words are written with no accountability. Opinions are expressed and communicated as truth, even if not. Personal desires are offered as absolute purpose in life. These are some of the things that modern technology has promoted since the development of electronic medium some 70 years ago. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 1 says that a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. This is not healthy for society or for culture. Proverbs 18 verses 1 through 11. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. When the wicked comes, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes reproach. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters, the wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. It is not good to show partiality to the wicked or to overthrow the righteous in judgment. A fool's lips enter into contention and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles, and they go down into the inmost body. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own esteem. Proverbs chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. You know, it's amazing. People talk to me all the time and they say, well, you know the Bible, it's not relevant anymore. It's, it's, uh, it's old fashioned and uh, people don't listen to the Bible anymore. And, and I say, boy, are you wrong. The Bible is relevant today. We're going to learn that right now as we focus on these Proverbs. And as I begin, I want to tell you that you can receive the Bible guide. It comes every month to your house. We'll send it to you if you let us know that you're there. And we'll be happy to do that. Or you can go to our website if you send an offering in any amount. Go to our website with an offering in any amount. And we will give you the download of the PDF files. And you can get the Bible guide right away and learn with us as we go through the Word of God, which is very important. Now, here's my question to you in our Steps of Faith. I ask the question, the lonely person. Now we look at Proverbs chapter 18 
through 20. Now, if we read that, we're keeping up through the Bible, and it's great when you read the whole Bible. It is very exciting, actually. And we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 18, verses 1 through 11 today. Now, Janice has already read this for you. It is very good. And I want to tell you, we're going to slow down and say, Lord, what are you showing us today? Because this is important. Now, remember what I said. At the beginning, I talked about how that many people say the Bible is no longer relevant. Well, let's consider this carefully when we look at Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18, verses 1 to 3. Now, listen carefully. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. Okay, right there. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. It continues, he rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. When the wicked comes, contempt comes also. And with dishonor comes reproach. Now, what are we talking about here? What we learn carefully is when lonely and cut off from others, when we become lonely and cut off from others, we have a distorted view of reality. A distorted view of reality. Beloved, we must fellowship with God's people. I know that there are people who are up in, you know, Podunk, Idaho, or somewhere up in Canada, way up in the, no and there's nobody around, and they're the only people in thousands of miles. But that's rare. And beloved, I want to tell us that we need to get to church. We need to get someplace where we can get a hold of God's people. If you have a city that you're close to, then check the listings for a good church. We need to get back to church. I remember one person telling me, well, you know, I'm not a churchgoer. I don't go to church because I just look at the TV and the internet and I stay at home. Well, that's a, that's a problem. And others are hurt by the church. But you need to go back and you need to find a church where God's people are so you can fellowship with them. That is so important. And that's relevant today. He says in verse 4, The words of a man's mouth are deep waters, and the wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. It is not good, it is not good to show partiality to the wicked or to overthrow the righteous in judgment. A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for blows. Now that's interesting because in verse 7 it continues, A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of the talebearer are like a tasty trifles, and they go down into the innermost body. Now that is fascinating. As we look at this, we need to consider, it is not good to overthrow righteous people in judgment. We must listen to them individually, not as a group. So many people want to listen and they want to take people and say, well, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a, you know, I'm left, I'm right, I'm middle, I'm, you know. Forget it. Hold on a minute. We are individuals and God has spoken to us and we have individual ideas. And if we don't, we've got a problem. If we just say, I don't know what to believe, I believe what, uh, what he believes. That's a problem. Because you are called to develop your own attitude and develop your own ideas. And that's very important. So when we go to the church and we see the people, we're going to be cooperative with them. But at the same time, we're individuals in the body of Christ. Very important that the Bible tells us that. Well, we must move on. This is chapter 18, verses 9 through 11. The Bible tells us, He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him, who is a great destroyer. Really? Can you believe that? That's amazing. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run in and are safe. And then it continues, the rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall is his own esteem. Now when we consider this, and we look at it, we have to understand that a lazy man's is a brother to a great destroyer. It is not good for us not to work. It is not good for us to be lazy. We must pay careful attention and work diligently. 
This is something that the Scripture tells us, that the Bible explains to us. He says, listen, now if you want to, you know, be a lazy man, you know, you're a brother to a destroyer. A destroyer? That's right. Don't be lazy. We need to work as if we're working for the Lord. Now that's in the New Testament. We're going to get to the New Testament soon enough in a month or two. And we're going to look at this and understand what God is saying to us, beloved, that when we work, whatever we do, we must work as to the Lord. We must set an example. There's a possibility to set an example with our work in our place to be an example for Jesus Christ. Now, if we go to work all the time and all we do is complain, well, what kind of example for Jesus Christ is that? We need to be a better example. And I know it's hard and I know it's difficult. But we need to set our mind on the things of God and say, Lord, I will, whoever I touch today, I will be there and I will be ready for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help me today. The next important city that you and I are going to be studying today is the city of Mizpah. Earlier on we looked at Megiddo, which was a, a very famous ancient fortified city. It's been extensively excavated today. And uh, now we're going to move on to Mizpah, a little bit different. Also a fortified city, shows up many times in the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, it also has been extensively excavated. The city of Mizpah was established as an important site early in the history of Israel. In the time period of the judges, Mizpah was used as a national rallying point for a man of the Levites who asked for national justice. At the end of the time period of the judges, recorded in the book of 1 Samuel, the prophet Samuel judged the nation from Mizpah. He also held national gatherings at the city and eventually, Israel's first king, Saul, was presented to the nation at Mizpah. The name Mizpah means watchtower or lookout, and the city was located centrally in the country within the territory of Benjamin. Its importance as an administrative center of sorts is demonstrated not only by its use during the days of the judges and Samuel, but also by its utilization by conquering nations, Years later, when Judah would be taken over by the empire of Babylon, Mizpah would be used by Babylon as an administrative center and would become the city that Governor Gedaliah would attempt to encourage the people from. There have been two archaeological sites considered for the identification of ancient Mizpah. Both are within a 10-mile range from Jerusalem, and both fit well after excavations with the biblical narrative. Tel and Naspa, however, is the site often considered the more likely of the two. It was thoroughly excavated from 1926 to 1935. The overseeing archaeologist excavated over two-thirds of the site, nearly unheard of at that time. He is also still praised for the meticulous records he kept that say for us, descriptions of roads, buildings, potteries, and landscape that may have been seen by Samuel himself. This month, we are able to send out the first DVD in our Biblical History and Archaeology segment library. These DVDs are topical collections of Corey's aired television segments to help you dig deeper into the Bible's past. This first DVD is entitled Genesis and Early History. Its 30 segments discuss how the Bible was recorded, compares ancient creation mythologies to Genesis, taking on the accusation that Genesis is a borrowed pagan myth. They survey the flood of Noah from a historical perspective and take listeners through the time of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All 30 segments strive to be informative and engaging, and while all have been seen previously on Quick Study Television, they are now available for the first time in a DVD collection. 
If you'd like to have this first DVD collection of 30 of Corey's television segments, we would love to send it to you. For a suggested donation of $25 or more, we'll send you this informative collection of 30 television segments. Make sure to write or call and ask for Biblical History and Archaeology Segment Library, Genesis and Early History. Thanks for staying with us here on Quick Study Television. I am glad you did. From Genesis to Revelation, it is a good time to do that. We're getting ready to go into the New Testament mm -hmm. soon. That's going to be fascinating. But we got to go through the rest of the Proverbs, and also we have to go through some interesting books in the, uh, the prophets. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, next time on Quick Study Television, the hearts of rulers are controlled by God. Now, that is a good question. What does that mean? And we'll talk about that and more. We are told that in the Proverbs, and we'll discuss all of that next time on Quick Study. Right now, Mysteries of the Bible with Ryan. Did you know that one of the requirements to be a king of Israel was to write out the whole Torah? It's true. Well, it's likely that King Solomon, who is the author and compiler of the book of Proverbs, did this as well. And though he was regarded as the wisest man who ever lived, According to tradition, he did not understand this one particular command given in the Torah. It was a complete mystery to him. Let's explore. Though written thousands of years ago, the Bible, and particularly the Torah, contains advanced medical procedures and prescriptions far ahead of its time, thus demonstrating the Bible's supernatural origin. Indeed, one of the most fascinating and mysterious prescriptions in the Bible is the water of purification from the red heifer sacrifice. In fact, according to Jewish tradition, even King Solomon, who is regarded as the wisest man who ever lived, did not understand this one command of God. In Numbers chapter 19, God instructs the priest to sacrifice with fire a red heifer without defect outside of the camp. Then the priest was to take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet yarn and throw them into the fire, burning the heifer. Then the ashes were to be mixed with the water. The primary significance of this passage is a spiritual one. Here we can see an image of the future sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, as both were sinless and without blemish. Both were sacrificed outside the camp or city walls, and the red heifer was one of the very few female sacrifices. Significantly, Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a woman and of a slave. In addition to the spiritual significance, however, is also the medical significance of the water of purification. We now know that this water cedar hyssop solution was actually a type of soap. The cedar oil contained in this solution, which came from a species of juniper tree native to Israel and Sinai, was a skin irritant which would encourage scrubbing. The hyssop tree associated with mint, possibly majorum, would produce hyssop oil. The hyssop oil is actually a very effective antiseptic and antibacterial agent. Indeed, hyssop contains the antiseptic thymol, which is the active ingredient in Listerine. Even the author of Hebrews recognized both the medical and spiritual significance of this passage. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, he says, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How fascinating. Here, thousands of years ago, was a prescription for decontamination, just one of the many medical prescriptions found in the Bible. Of course, the question we must ask is this. If the Bible isn't God's word, then how could it have such advanced knowledge? After all, other medical prescriptions popular in that time by the surrounding cultures were extremely dangerous and oftentimes fatal. May we be wise and always heed the word of God. Yeah, that's true, Ryan. Uh, there were a lot of books, the Egyptian books, the Babylonian books and everything that had these things in it. Very interesting. And the Bible's different, has the perfect prescription every single time. <laughs> what did you study today? Well, of course, we're in the book of Proverbs and there are so many wonderful truths in this book. I wanted to highlight Proverbs 18 verses 10 and 11. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. 
The righteous run to it and are safe. Verse 11 says, the rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own esteem. So, you know, we talk about the Lord's name and here it's talking about Yahweh. That implies his character as the eternal, the powerful, the faithful, covenant-keeping God. Now, a strong tower was a central place in a region or a city that when there was trouble, when there was danger, the people would run to that uh, central tower to be safe. And that's what the name of the Lord is. And those who are right with God, those who have said, yes, God, be a part of my life. I want to serve you. I want to be your child. I want to follow Jesus Christ. We call on that name and he is our safety. He is our strong tower in times of trouble and he is faithful and he proves himself over and over and over again. Now it talks about the rich man relying on his wealth. Now that doesn't mean that all rich people don't know God. Quite the contrary. There are many, many people that God has blessed with wealth and they love God and call on his name. We're talking about a rich man who is not calling upon the name of the Lord, but depends on his wealth as his strength. And in times of trouble, he sees it as a high wall around a fortified city. But we know in reality that wealth is a fleeting thing, that your wealth can't save you in all times of trouble. Only the Lord Jesus can. That's right. And, and it's always fascinating to me to see how the Proverbs uses these demonstrations, tower, yes. walls around the city mm -hmm. and all of this to illustrate the power of taking someone down or somebody not having. And they're timeless. Yeah, and, and they really are. And so that's really, really interesting. Well, let's study on now on the program. It is important to learn and listen to others. A popular trend in today's lifestyle is called a selfie taken with a cell phone. We love to take pictures of ourselves, but they are worthless in conjunction with the good of humanity. It is crucial that believers in Jesus Christ not look at ourselves as the greatest thing since sliced bread. We must hear God's words when he speaks to his servants, the body of Christ. You know, the wisdom of God is amazing, and in His great wisdom, God has provided a way. You know, I often say it, but it's true. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came, and He died on the cross, living a perfect life. We actually killed Him. He allowed us to do that. And He died on the cross and rose again on the third day, a miraculous resurrection in the flesh. And he did that so that we can call on him and say, Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord. Help me now. <laughs> 